in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, now I don't know if that's suddenly, you know, I've heard a lot of different preaching from that. He said it was going to happen. So I don't know if you can call it suddenly. But because we're so time trapped and trapped in the world, yeah. Maybe they were like us. You show up to church and, wow, we had a move of God tonight. Well, what'd you come for? Is it really suddenly? We should have came here expecting. Ah, uh, Maybe you're catching on with me tonight. Suddenly they came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared under them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Simple title tonight. I, 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 I do hope to get you where I want you to get spiritually tonight. This is probably every born again believer's battle. Though I don't know I've ever heard anybody real nail the subject like I'm going to try to nail it tonight. Let your, place your Bibles down. Let's talk to God. Jesus, Lord, we're thankful for your presence, your power. We're thankful for the plan of salvation and, and, and the manifestations that let us know and speak to us and get a, give us a clear indication that we're not only on the right path, but we're full of the Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in other tongues. We're, we're thankful for that, God. But I ask for your unction and your help today. Open every heart and mind to receive your word, Lord. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. God bless you. I want to speak to you on the simple subject of Holy Ghost power. You can be seated. If you have a good attitude, you can be seated. Amen. Acts 1 and 8, Jesus is saying, but you shall receive power. Yes, right. Power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Power precedes the witness. And, and, and I'm probably guilty, and I'm try to be very true. I, I, I try to, and Friends Day is really the premise behind Friends Day is for you to be a witness and maybe a little tongue in cheek tonight because it's still Brother Crow. I may not be at full capacity. I'm still trying to get my strength back and you know, I may get it back. I may not ever get it back, but that's in God's hands. May, maybe sending you out to be a witness is to fill the church so that we can have a Friends Day. Maybe Maybe it's premature because it's hard to be a witness without the power. And it's painful to be told that because we all like to feel that I'm saved. I spoke in tongues. I got the Holy Ghost. I, I've been baptized in Jesus. I'm saved. But understand something very powerful and specific happened on the day of Pentecost in that upper room. We know that there was a sound from heaven, yes, described as a mushing, uh, mushing, rushing mighty wind. I guess mighty and rushing put together as mushing. I'm making words by the minute. Stick around. Hallelujah. But what really happened that day was they were all filled with fire. Now, we shouldn't be shocked because Jesus said it in Acts 1 and 8, but John, who proceeded and prepared the way, made a statement in Luke chapter 3, 16 and 17, if you like to turn there in your Bibles. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latitude of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John is saying, listen. <laughs> there's a better baptism coming. There's something more powerful coming to you. And, and, and he didn't just finish there because he put a premise that we need 
you and I need to take to heart whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor. It's his house. It's his floor. He'll blow people right out of here under the understanding of what Scripture says. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. The fire is to burn up the useless out of our lives. This will not be popular today. This will not be popular if you're living the American dream. Because it's fixing to turn into the apostolic nightmare. Listen, John referenced the wheat being gathered and the chap being burned up. Listen, God, God did this. He created this plan of salvation and this undeniable power of the Holy Ghost to stop the devil from beating up his people. John 10 and 10 declares the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. The sad thing is, is we, we think an abundant life is full of the things of the world. I'm blessed. My bills are paid. I'm blessed. Look at look how much I own. Look, look. look. And because the world today's mindset, money is power. The, you see, the problem in the government is about money. We know our, a lot of our politics, if they got money out of, of the government and everybody served the short term and got paid based on the, on the level of the state's economy, every one of them be doing more for their state than for themselves. Can anybody, can we believe that? Well, listen, how many of us are still basing things on our financial power. So we're, we're really no spiritually different than those in the government. So be careful that you look down on them. The Holy Ghost is to lead us and guide us to separate us from the uselessness. The Holy Ghost fires to burn up the chaff. But how many of us are walking so much in the spirit that the chaff is burned out of our lives? How many are Holy Ghost empowered right now? Well, how many are great witnesses right now? I didn't come to tickle your ears. I come to reach for your soul. Are you hearing me tonight? If your first instinct is, man, I'm all that in a bag of chips because what you got in the bank, well, how's your treasure in heaven's bank? Galatians, Paul speaking, says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not feel the lust of the flesh. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm getting pretty good at taking care of my flesh. I got a PhD in that. I, I, I understand that little feeling in my stomach means I need to eat. I got my diploma on eating. Yeah, I, I got my diploma on learning how to wheel and deal and make sure that I got what my family needs. I, I got that. I got, I got the chaff in spades. But where's the fire? Where's the Holy Ghost power? How is it that some of us know how to navigate everything when it comes to our worldly account? But we come, I don't know what God's doing. I, I don't even know God's hearing me in here today. I don't even know. Can, how does that account? For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. Understand, if you're feeding the lust dog, that spiritual dog's going to be weak and anemic. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Listen, let me say it this way. When sin or the flesh or worldliness is viewed superficially, it's going to be dealt with superficially. It's easy to come in here. You're really not going to deal with your worldliness because you don't look at it being all bad. Because how bad is it to have money in the bank and be able to eat what you want on your way home tonight? Feels pretty good to be able to pay them bills. Feels pretty good to know the air conditioning's on and the food is in the belly. And the, uh, 
the spaghetti's on. Right? There ain't nobody here poor, blind, and naked. Y'all got shoes and socks on, and you got clothes, and, and, and there's nobody here on the verge of starving. We're going to run over and give you a cup of water and feed you. We're doing pretty good, right? There are many people seeking the power without seeking the purity of God. Godly purity leads to Holy Ghost power. The problem is our lives are filled with the chaff. Hebrews 12 and 14 says, Follow peace with all men, yeah. and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Remember, listen to this. Remember, these folks, in, these folks in the upper room didn't go home to homes filled with what our homes are filled with. They didn't go home to a radio. They didn't, as soon as they get out of the upper room, get their phone out to check their Facebook. And get out there and call whoever they needed to call. Oh, I missed a text from so and so. Oh, I got to go now. I got this. You know, we're so connected to the chaff. We got our televisions and our radios and our internet connections and. All these things supply our entertainment issues we have today. They didn't have a bunch of junk sidetracking their new life. When they left the upper room, they couldn't wait to get back there. Now, I'm going to say this. God didn't fill our homes with that stuff. We did. And we did it by choice. So if we have a developed the ability to fill our lives and we've all said if I can afford it I'm going to get it. Come on now. Shoot man. I want a number three. Hold them onions. Give me my Mountain Dew and I want that big turtle. The fact that I even got that memorized. I'm all in on that. So if we could be all in on that, what's it going to take for us to instead fill our lives and, and homes with godliness? Wait a minute. If I could walk into Freddy's and know what I want, why can't I walk into my home? God, I need the power of God here. It's amazing. People can walk in and see our lives, and we're so blessed, and they see chaff because we don't want them... Because we think that's power. But we have no Holy Ghost power. Out of the, listen to this. Out of the 120 people that gathered in obedience to seek the Lord and wait for that promise, do you know how many were left out? Nobody. They were all. Y'all go take it on the negative. Take it on the positive. Stick around later. They all got it. Everyone that was in that room got it. Everybody got filled. Everybody. Oh, no one left out. Every person got their own flame. Every person got their own fire. Everyone was responsible for maintaining that fire. Y'all got the fire. Y'all got to maintain that fire. So it follows today that everyone who has come into the household of faith should have their own flame. How's your fire? Because if you have the fire, you'll burn up the chap and have no problem doing it. Oh, you're responsible for how on fire you are. Let me tell you something. For all you people that get up here and sing, that get up here and preach, don't ever, I won't hurt y'all's feelings, don't get it to impress these folks. I'm not a trying to impress one of you. Now, I want to do a good job. I never want to get up here with nothing to say. That's kind of awkward. No, I'm not, I don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. How many would want me to come in unprepared to do that? So speakers, while I don't want you to come in to impress them, you need to come and prepare to speak to them. 
and don't be the kind of person who'll wait to get asked, then you'll get something ready. That means you aren't ready all the time. Are you hear what I'm saying? Every child of God should have their own personal experience with and connection to the Holy Ghost on their own. I love my wife, but my Holy Ghost ain't going to get her to heaven. She's got to have her own. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Jesus knew that the early church, the church as a whole, was going to need more than ceremonies and speeches. I, I'll be honest with you. I thank God for good Holy Ghost filled stepping on my toes preaching. I don't, I, I, I don't need no, I, well, I, let me lay it to you. I don't need when I go see the doctor, you know, I won't make you feel good. I don't give a rip about feeling good. Make me leave here that I'm healthy. We're going to need power from on high. Jesus knew you were going to need. Listen, folks, if you're going to make it to heaven, you're going to need power from on high. If you Listen, if you don't give making to heaven any concern, you are probably already in a serious situation. Jesus knew that the Holy Spirit was the supernatural empowerment and equipment that you and I and that the church would need. He knew that everything necessary to defeat the devil, to defeat what you're going through as an individual. If you're married to a jerk that beats you, if you're married to a wife that's unfaithful to you, if you're in a world that doesn't care about your soul, I don't care if you're, if you're in a life of want or in a life of plenty, you need the Holy Ghost that's going to lead and God. The rich young ruler probably went to hell. So wealth ain't going to get you there. The poor widow with two mites. Jesus was enamored with her giving, probably with that. So you need to understand something. You need something supernatural to get you to heaven. And so he did everything and gave us everything we needed to defeat not only the devil, but our flesh. If people get mad at the preaching, you're not mad at my preaching. You're mad the fact that I pointed out your lie. I pointed out your proclivity, your issue. And so God knew that, well, he chose the foolishness of preaching to say, but you're still going to have to have the Holy Ghost that will lead and guide you into all truth. And I'll be honest with you, I don't, nothing's changed, folks. You still have that power from on high. Let me tell you something. Hell is on a rampage. Demons are going crazy. The warfare is on every level like you've never seen. You don't think that the ridiculousness that is going on is by coincidence. The, we turn around and the church needs to be this. The church, no, you and I need to be there. You and I need to be. You and I. Man. Listen, when Jesus turned and said, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a powerful church. That's powerful people. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, let's take one minute. Stand to your feet, lift up your hands, and thank God for it. If you're not, stay in your seat. Thank God right now. Create a channel for the move of God. Create a channel. Welcome the Holy Ghost. Like that up. Welcome the power of the Holy Ghost. Welcome it in Jesus' name. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The church needs to be on fire to burn up the chaff of worldliness. Amen. Amen. Now hold on, because I want to define this. I want to break this down a little bit. But we got that part in spades. Because sadly, you be seated. Much of the church meanders around in kind of a 
a stupor. Come on, be honest. How many struggle with old things that you done should have whipped a long time ago? How many of you still deal with some things? You... I got any real people here today. How many, yeah, 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 you've allowed old things you had whoop come back in because that's ah, not necessary to be that spiritual today. Many people become hypnotized and under some kind of demonic, we don't want to call it that, but demonic spell and they, they, they stumble around like zombies and they have no spiritual direction and no purpose and no power. And they're easily offended. Mm-hmm. The devil and the hordes of hell are, are so focused. Hell is focused and unified on its purpose to steal, kill, and destroy. It's undeniable the effects of spiritual wickedness today, and it abounds. We, we've just seen the wickedness in children and in adults and in society today. We, we, we literally live in a day today where they're wanting to use chemicals and drugs to alter little children. They, they literally are fighting today because they want to destroy a baby in the womb. Now, I, I'm, it's not about, you, you can make it about politics, it's not. Because long, there's other ways to stop that baby from being in the womb if you lose a little effort. But I don't want to get into that, that's not my subject. But we can all plainly see and we all have to daily contend with the issues of hell and worldliness, right? Our, 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 our world and our country is overrun with wickedness in high places, right? Can, 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 can we admit that the world's wicked? That there are people out there that just hate you for your color, hate you for your religion, hate you for your belief. If you don't, I heard a story this week of a teacher who, who, who took a group of kids out, and they were playing against one another in, in a simple game of dodgeball. And the team that was looting started cussing and flipping out the winning team. That never would have happened when I was a child. There was something about sportsmanship. There was something. And, and now, and now uh, we don't know if we can punish these children because let's call the parents. I tell you, I hate to break, and you need to call the parents out, not to call, not call them what they need. Those, par those parents are chaff. They're worldly, and they're leading their children to stay. Listen, it's okay to not fit in around here. If you fit into the world, maybe you need to get back to where you fit back in the church. Now, listen, don't get me wrong. I am thankful for every patriotic man and woman. I I I'm, I'm thankful for the efforts that, that, that they're trying to save America. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for it. But don't get confused here. It's going to take supernatural power, not patriotism, to save the souls of this country. You want to put your foot down and think waving an American flag, and I'm all for it. But get over yourself and thinking that your politics is what the world is. Uh -uh, it needs the salvation power of the Holy Ghost in your life. Don't talk. Don't talk to me about all your patriotism if you have no Holy Ghost power. Because we've entered a time where everyone in our house and everyone in this house needs the fire. Every person who occupies a seat in this church needs the fire of the Holy Ghost operating in them and through them. We can't afford to have, even, even our people, for, forgive me, not on the bench need to be on fire. Even the people sitting in the cheap seat, if they, hey, we need you on fire. There's not a wasted seat in the house. Not one person was left out on the day of Pentecost. You can't sit here and not get on fire. Everyone needs to get on fire. No one was left out. God doesn't want you left out. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Young, old, rich, well, it doesn't matter that background. It doesn't matter what situation it's in. Every person in the house got to have their own flame. 
They all each had a personal encounter with the fire of God. When that flame touched them, something happened in their bellies. The Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now we know, and I'm not going to go deep into this. The Bible tells us, James tells us, the tongue is the most unruly member. That's why that's the one that's got to yield up. You can struggle with what you believe. You can struggle, but that's how the church started, and that's how the church is going to go out. If you don't, if you don't realize that, you miss some pages in the book. Sadly, the majority of people who witnessed would have not made the connection between Jesus' words and what happened in the upper room. He said in Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. Jesus decides, not you and I. We're not going to add or take away from the word. Jesus said that when the Holy Ghost came upon them that they would receive power. Everybody say power. power. The word power in the Greek is dunamis. It means force, literally or even figuratively. Specifically, it means miraculous power, power for performing miracles, moral power, and excellence of the soul, or power and influence. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples and apostles knew exactly what had happened to them. When they were filled with the Holy Ghost, as the Spirit gave utterance, they knew that they had been baptized with the Holy Ghost that John had talked about. They, they weren't confused when that suddenly happened to them. They were waiting for it to happen. The miracle working power had moved on the inside of them. And this is where I believe many, even in the church, have missed something. We failed to connect the dots or have allowed ourselves to stop connecting the dots. We think receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost is about speaking in tongues. And so we get like, man, I spoke in tongues. We think, hallelujah, mission accomplished. I spoke in tongues. I'm done. That's like getting baptized in Jesus' name and thinking you're done. You didn't complete the process. Now, let me say, and I, we do believe and teach that the initial evidence of being filled with the Spirit of God is speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. In fact, it's actually stated in Acts 10 when Cornelius, who was a Gentile, it even says in Acts 10, 44, 47, they, they even define that this is how they knew. And when Peter gets to make these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. See, there's something about hearing and believing and obeying. You don't have to like it. It don't have to be your way because this is God's thing. It's not yours. He's just giving you an invitation. And they of the, un, the, of the circumcision, the Jews, which believed, were astonished. As many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles. This ought to get you excited because that's us. Also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know? They just felt something? That didn't work. That's confusion. I could have pizza last night. I ain't feeling all that something else. Could have ate them hot peppers. And it goes on and says, for they heard them speak with tongues. That's that power. That's that stuff that you can't control. That's the thing that wealth can't control it. Intelligence can't control That's a God thing. Yeah, it equalizes the playing field. You have to understand, God ain't going to give this thing over to people. To he was sick of ceremony. He was tired of religion and wanted it to be a relationship, an undeniable experience. You could be in prison and get the Holy Ghost. You could be in a palace and get the Holy Ghost power. But you got to get the power of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter. We kind of got this singing in verse from what I first preached. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost, as well as we? He, he put the, Peter put the connection. It's a biblical connection, folks. I, I don't care what anybody's told you or taught you. If you haven't done this, I encourage you. Don't seek to speak in tongues. Seek the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus didn't emphasize speaking with tongues. You will speak with other tongues when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Yes, the emphasis was on the power, not on the proof you received. Did you hear me?
He said, you shall receive power after that hope. Where are you going with this? Listen. Jesus said, but tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. Believe me, I believe in speaking in tongues. I, I, and I honestly endeavor to try to get myself prayed through enough to do that every day. And I tell you, if you're going to be any type of Christian, you need to as well. But the concern is, and my concern, and, and, and I believe it is also the concern of heaven, is that we've made the act of speaking in tongues a substitute for the actual power. It's my prayer that there's an awakening in this. I'm responsible for this church. I, I, let me tell you something. It's not how many you get to the building, it's how many you get to heaven. And that's. I, I, so you have to understand something. If you don't make it from here, it's not because I didn't teach it. If you don't make it from here, it ain't going to be because you, you weren't loved or, or given effort to. It's because you chose to sit there and not do nothing with what you were given. I pray that every elder. Every believer, young, old, new convert, brand new baby, wakes up to what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is all about. It's about power. Some of us say, man, I just need to speak in tongues. No, you, if you'll get the power, that's going to happen. Mm. This mighty baptism of fire is not just to comfort ourselves and to convince ourselves that I'm okay. I'm okay. I spoke in tongues today. I, I'm good. Who cares if you bust out all over the place in here and loudly speak in tongues on Sunday and just blow it up to where you have to wait a few minutes for you to get your composure again. And I'm not against all that. Fine, do that. But what good is that if you never overcome your addiction? What, what, what good is that? And what message are you sending people? You talk about you're the born again, you're the believer, but you're still. You walk around with a sour puss attitude. Ain't no one want what you got. If that's what the whole, I don't want. Everybody's got to walk around in eggshells. They're not offending you. You you can't get along with what the church is trying to do, what the pastor's trying because you think you're. Let me tell you, if you get the power of the Holy Ghost, you'll find out your opinion ain't all that in a bag of chips. You get the power of the Holy Ghost, you'll get over that grievance that you got with your neighbor. This, this baptism is what Jesus said it is. It is the baptism of power from on high. I need that power. It is the power to destroy the works of the devil. Let me tell you something. Anybody think the devil's not working on you? Anybody here think you just got a free ride? The devil ain't concerned with you. We have the power to destroy the works of the devil. That ought to, that ought to do something to you. That ought, wait, why is it that we're so, man, man, I got, man, I can go, I'm going to leave right here right now and go buy you a steak. Right now, I got the money. I can make my house payment. I, I can make my car payment. I, I got the, I can buy this. I can buy. But we walk into the church and you're not concerned about the works of the devil tonight? What good is it to gain the whole world and you lost your soul because you have access to the power, but you're more worried about the chaff? Do you realize the power of the Holy Ghost is the same power that we need to heal the sick? To cast out the, wait a minute, you, you got something going on. You, you got a child that's going through something and you're not seeking Holy Ghost power? You'll, you'll, you'll wait in line, and you'll sit in the waiting room in the doctor's office, and you'll go through all that. I'm not saying not to do that, but I'm saying you'll do all that, but you'll never seek the face of God and seek the power in, in, for a suddenly move of God right here in the house. I wonder if we got people walking around like spiritual zombies. You're not seeking God. You Wait a minute. You think you got him sewed up after, well, we'll use me, 55 years and four days of life. I got it sewed up. I don't need anything tonight. I think I got it sewed up that there's a the power not accept that that, that I, I I've got it I got it off after 55 years. 
if I was to get myself in the power of the Holy Ghost, if we get seeking the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, yeah, the sick could be healed, devils could be cast out, captives could be set free, open the eyes of the blind. If we'll get the Holy Ghost power, if we'll, the deaf could hear, the lame could walk, the blind could see, the dead could be raised. But we're in that stupor. I made it to church. Acts 10, 30, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. John 4, 12, Jesus said, Very, very, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these. Wait a minute. But I spoke in tongues. You have to understand. Jesus, the reason Jesus in using the metaphor of going to his father has to do with going and doing the works and greater that he did. The answer is he said that when he went to the Father that he would send the Comforter, the Holy Ghost. Jesus knew that when we received the Holy Ghost that we would then have the same power in us that was working in him. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelt in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Romans 8 and 11. He that believeth on me as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. There should be some living water flowing out of you. But you've got to get the living water inside of you. John said, I baptize you with water under repentance, but there is one coming after me who is mightier than I. When he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John is saying, yeah, my baptism is important. You need to repent of your sins and be saved. But my baptism ain't enough. There's another baptism you need. The baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. You need the Holy Ghost and fire. Some of you need to realize. Some of you need to be honest. Some of you need to be brutal. You know, I got to get that Holy Ghost power. I believe with a great deal of certainty that most of us who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost with the biblical evidence of speaking in tongues really don't know the magnitude of what we receive. We kind of think, you know, Brother Ezekiel, Hey, cool, I got the Holy Ghost. I got the starter pack. I got the beginner's edition. You know, when I've been around a while, maybe I'll have the full package like the elders. Maybe. You know, I, I got enough just to get started. You know, we read the Bible, we know that Paul and Peter had the full package, but I just got that introductory package and sometime down the road when I prayed enough and I fasted enough and I've been faithful enough and I paid my tithes enough and when I read the Bible through a few times in one year and maybe then God will give me the rest the problem with that is that kind of thinking diminishes what you've already received that kind of thinking, that kind of understanding, and, and, and it's that this understanding gets been handed down to us. Let's be honest. Some of us sit around more concerned with the chap than we have. I'm, I'm pastor and I'm guilty. But not after this, I'm not. Because that kind of thinking, that kind of teaching, it restricts and it hinders the operation of the Holy Ghost that can happen 
now. And there are going to be some people that the service is going to make no difference. They'll be no different next week than they are last week because they, they don't really want the Holy Ghost power. I get that. I'm fine with that. that that's, that's not, I'm trying to reach for those who want it. I'm trying to reach for those who really want this church to be God's church. Not yours, not mine, his church. We're going to bust that paradigm right out of here. Let me, let, let, let me try to give you a ridiculous analogy. Well, just go hold your ears. I get an eye roll from my analogies because you got to understand that thinking. If I was to take, Brother Terry, if I was to take your Bronco and go fill it, the whole back, because he got the full size one. He, you know, he's got the man's truck. <laughs> Just fill the back of that with plastic explosives. Man, you you'd be loaded. You 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 you'd, you'd be loaded with explosive power. But if I came in and said, "Hey, brother Terry, just so you know, I put a couple of cases of big lighters in your trunk." You're going to go hop in that truck, fire that 351 up, and not even think about it again, not even give it another thought. And he'd be just driving around, think, hey, number big lighters back there. That ain't nothing to worry about. That ain't going to do nothing for nobody. Who gives a rip? And you would not realize, you wouldn't think about it, that you'd be driving around with enough power to blow a pretty good sized hole in Phoenix, but you would be acting like you didn't have anything. You would be acting and conducting yourself on the basis of what you think, what you believe to be true, and not by what you really have. Are you hearing me? That's what the Holy Ghost is saying to each and every one of us today. You see, when that Holy Ghost came to reside in you, he came at full strength. You're, you're packed. You're loaded to the gills. They're supernatural, miracle-working, mouth-moving, devil-busting power inside of you to full capacity. It's all in there. It may not be ragu, but it's in there. It's in there. But most of you acting and living like you just got a couple of big lighters in your trunk. Well, that's like most of us think. You know, it's not the power that I was hoping for. But at least I got some tongues. At least I got something to get me started. I can't wait to get here next Sunday when pastor preaches one of those Sunday morning mass because these Wednesday night ones, they don't quite do it for me. I need a little more to light off my big lighters. Can I tell you something? I believe the devil loves that thinking. I believe the enemy of your soul loves that thinking. As you sit there right now, unmoved, you don't want to be moved. You're happy. You're comfortable. You're satisfied. You're content. I got big lighters if I need to start a fire. I believe that's exactly where the devil wants you. I believe that's exactly what he wants you to believe. He wants you to sit there, well, if I ever need to. Jesus said that when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, that you will receive. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. You will have power. Stop. Jesus said you'll have power, and you sit there like all you got is a big lighter. You walk around this world like all you got is a big lighter. You come crying in here like all you got is a big. The devil just wants you to, well, 
and, and, and let me just go ahead and throw some insult in there. And that some of you, you ain't spoken in tongues in so long. Don't blame God. His word says this. Your opinion and your chaff has gotten in the way. Don't blame God. Don't blame the church. Don't blame the preacher. When you get home, look in the mirror. There's your problem. Because the tongues are just the initial evidence that the power is there. They have this little thing for electricians. If you've been around electricity for a while, it's called an idiot light. Plug it in, it tells you there's power there. Oh, there's light. So you know there's power there. That's what the tongues is. There's power there. There's power. But you got to tap into it. Yeah, that, that plug. Those plugs that we got all around. That it, there's power there. But you got to plug into it. You, if you got the Holy Ghost, the power's there. You just got to activate it. You got to cultivate it. You've got to, like, like Paul, you've got to stir up that gift that is in you because you will become a spiritual zombie, powerless, prayerless. But it's still there. The devil knows it's there. And now you know that it's there. You see, when John baptized with water, they were baptized. Then he said the mightier baptism is coming next. It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. You see, you don't get the Holy Ghost today, and then when you've survived the six-month trial period, he'll send you the power. <laughs> it's the same baptism at the same time. And the devil's been very effective in making us believe that all of us, all we got was a little excitement and a quiver in tongue. Because the devil knows if we ever realize the power that already is in us, he'd be in trouble. It's it. Turn to your neighbor and say, that power's there. And so the enemy has been telling the church and telling us for centuries that the power... That, that, that Jesus had the power and Paul and Peter had the power, but somehow we have to earn that power. Well, the whole time the devil has known that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you right now. You have to understand that if you get what I'm preaching tonight, the very thought that you might realize the power you have makes this, that you make this discovery tonight, terrifies the devil. Because he knows the moment, the very moment you believe the power's in you, you'll start counting on and drawing on that power. The moment you realize that, wait a minute, all I got to do is turn on what I've already got. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Notice we have this power. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it's not about the tongue. You need to understand you've been granted and given the power. As a matter of fact, you have all power that you can ever possibly receive because there is no more. It's all that you need. It's time we learn how to develop, how to depend, and how to draw on, and how to cooperate with that power. That's why you have to mature and learn to walk and be obedient. You can't hold hands with the devil and Jesus at the same time. You, de wow. you, you destroy and diminish the ability of the power. The Pharisees were consent, were a constant thorn, excuse me, in the sight of Jesus. They had no real desire to know God or be obedient to his commands. They simply followed Jesus around and questioned about everything he did. One day they were so upset, they said Jesus was casting out devils by the power of Beelzebub. Jesus told them that the source of his power to do miracles and cast out devils was the Spirit of God. I bring this to your attention tonight as we all stand. That the biggest hindrance and offense to the Holy Ghost and the manifestation of the power of God has always been and will always be 
dead religious worldly people. Listen to me, because I'm about to send, it's going to bother some of you. Religion can always find a place for doing some good things. Oh, you'll feed the poor. You can help the, the homeless and less fortunate. You'll hand out blankets and hand someone a gift card. But religion doesn't have a slot for someone operating in the power of God. Casting out demons, laying hands on the sick, cleansing the lepers and raising the dead. So what do they do? They attack those that do. The point is, if you want to walk in the same power that Peter and Paul did, you have to be prepared for the same treatment. Let me be direct with you today and tell you that I believe the world, specifically our country, is in the worst condition that it's ever been. I didn't say that because we need to join the group of the gloom and doomers. I say that because now more than ever, it is indisputably clear that our only hope is God. That's why like never before, don't look around the room. This, this is not for everybody else. This is for you. Hear me now. Hear what I'm saying tonight. And I'm saying it to each other. Don't, this ain't for the new people. Been around a little while, Sister Crow, but this is for you too. Mm -hmm. The church must wake up. We must wake up to the reality of the power of the Holy Ghost that lives in us. And every born again believer, we got to quit looking and waiting for some other anointing to fall on us and instead start tapping into the anointing that already dwells in us. Yea, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. It's in there, folks. It's already there. Jesus said, behold, I give you, I give you, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. The devil's greatest fear is not a coming revival that will turn everything around and make everything right. Church will be victorious right now in the midst of a perverse and untoward God. The church can be powerful right now when the world turns around, when we tune in and plug into the power of the Holy Ghost. The devil's greatest fear is the church right here, right now. We'll get a revelation that I need to tap into the power that I already have, that I have right now. Because if the devil can keep you putting it off into the future, then he will be successful in stealing, killing, and destroying and make a mockery out of each and every one of us. I'm not trying to get your emotions trying to get you cerebral spiritually right now we've got the power and we have got to learn to get, begin tapping back into that anointing and that power as i as i bring this to finality there are going to be two types look around right now two types of church folks church folks there will be the tares and the wheat the religious and the righteous the entertained or the empowered. George Orwell gave an illustration that I want to give you. You keep going lightly, you're good. You're not the focal point, you're the background. He gives a graphic illustration one day while he was sitting and eating. Anybody ever been out in a picnic and the wasps show up or the bees show up? And here he had some jelly that was left on his plate and he watched as this wasp kept coming in and eating it. Instead of swatting away the next time, he pulled out, a, see every man carried around a pocket knife back in the day. He pulled out his pocket knife. And the next time that wasp came, it was just sipping away 
at that jelly. He reached over and cut it in half. His knife was sharp, and he did it so quick that the wasp was completely unaware that it had been cut in half. And so as it's sipping it, he watches out of the back side of the cut half piece, of, the, the, the fluid of the jelly was, was flowing out of him. The wasp didn't know it had been cut in half until it went to do something. Anybody know what that was? He tried to try to fly. And he couldn't. How many of us are sipping at the plate of this worldliness, of all the stuff, the sweetness that you think is so important, and you don't even realize? See, understand that Thessalonians tells us that the, the day coming where every born again believer is going to expect to fly. How many expect to fly? How many expect to fly? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. I don't know about you. I want to turn and start drinking from the right source tonight.